I thought this morning, as we regularly do, first Sunday of the month, as we share communion, to have a focus upon this simple meal that we share together. So I wanted to read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, what we sometimes call the words of institution. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number have fallen asleep. Do this in remembrance of me. There are lots of things that bring memories to mind. I visited my parents last week, and one of the things I do is I get the old photo albums out, and we go through the photos. Talk about those exciting days as they reminisce, memories. Smells also. I don't know why it is, but as I approach Grimsby, I I just, it smells different up there. I mean, not a bad one, mainly fish and chips. It brings memories back. It's also helped that mum and dad have a great fish and chip shop just one minute round the corner. So whenever I go up, I say, mum, don't cook anything. You don't have to go to any trouble at all. We'll have fish and chips. Music does that. I'm sure you know music brings memories. question came to me this week, how, how would you like to be remembered? It's kind of a question you can either dismiss very quickly or you could spend days thinking, oh, how do I want to be remembered? I, always, I have always, since I became a follower of Jesus, found it interesting that Jesus never said, Remember me by building a mausoleum for me. Over the place where I rose from the dead. Although we have done. Holy Sepulchre Church, if you've ever been there. Or build for me a huge church over the site where I multiplied the loaves and the fish. He didn't say that. But we did do it. And in many ways, I'm thankful for that. As someone who's traveled through the Holy Land and these sites are remembered, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus chose bread and a cup. We know that he was celebrating Passover. We know that he is the fulfillment of that. But he said, do this in remembrance of me. And it marks not just a memory, but an ongoing relationship. Whenever we do this, in remembrance of him. It marks an ongoing encounter with the Lord Jesus. It marks a proclamation, a declaration, as the Apostle Paul writes in his letter, that you proclaim the Lord's death when you do this, until he comes. 
It's a declaration of unity. That when we share this meal together as his body, we recognize one another as part of the body of Christ. And forgive us, Lord, that we have made this simple meal into something that divides Christians. Different traditions. We meet in a school hall. The communion is set on a fold-away table with, dare I say, chewing gum stuck underneath, but not on top. Not really holy or reverent. That's the word. So whether it's mass, which means to go and proclaim, or Eucharist, which means thanksgiving, or communion, which means sharing and participating, or as Paul calls it here, the Lord's Supper in Corinthians. The only time it's called the Lord's Supper when Paul describes it. And in doing this, we look back at the sacrifice of Jesus, and we will be doing that. And Paul encourages us when we do this to look in and to examine ourselves. And don't get put off when Paul talks about eating this in an unworthy way. All of us are unworthy. That's not what he means. We're all here by the grace of God and to receive his grace. But as we come to this meal, we come with that thanksgiving and that commitment to Jesus, not doing it lightly. Following Jesus is not something you do sort of part-time, you know, it's okay, just a bit of my life, it's everything. We don't want to approach this meal in an unworthy way, but with Gratitude and love for Jesus. And we look around and we recognize one another. And we look forward. To the time when Jesus comes again. And. I have prayed more come Lord Jesus. In the past few weeks and months. Come, Lord Jesus. The passage we read is the earliest record of any words of Jesus. Paul wrote those words earlier than the Gospels. It's one of the very few incidents in Jesus' earthly life that actually Paul records. He refers to this direct revelation, I received from the Lord. Not I went to the apostles and heard from the apostles what I received from the Lord. The Lord Jesus spoke to Paul. It all started on the night that he was betrayed. And this meal, which brings such strength and consolation to us as followers of Jesus, began at the very moment when he was being betrayed. This is my body, which is for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, whatever your theological stance We believe that there is a real gift of the Savior in what we do together and what we share together. What happened to his body was for us. There was purpose. And notice that it's in the present continuous, which means keep on doing this. Keep on doing this. From the very first early days of the church, they broke bread and shared the cup. And 2,000 plus years later, we're sat in the school hall in Chipping Camden High School, sharing the bread and the cup, because we love Jesus. And we share with him in this. He provides on the cross forgiveness of sins and opens the way for the activity of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the believer. The old covenant fulfilled in Jesus, as he describes it, the new covenant sealed in his blood. In communion, we receive Christ again. 
Ask him to rule and reign over our hearts. I know Edward and I preach and others preach week by week. And we don't have to commit ourselves very far by listening to a sermon because you can walk out saying, that was nice. I didn't like that. I don't agree with that. But when you share in this meal, all are invited through faith in Jesus. A commitment. Your life to him. So what I thought I would do this morning is read through the scriptures taken from the various gospels but brought together. And I've got some pictures that they're stills from the Passion of the Christ. If you are squeamish, close your eyes, just listen to the words. But I think from time to time it is important to know and to recognize the suffering that Jesus went through. So that we don't approach this in an unworthy manner and make light of all that Jesus did for us on the cross. The Last Supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again, eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. Son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. I am, Jesus said. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Jesus before Pilate, very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. They bound Jesus, led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. 
So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one of you do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. They shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Soldiers mock Jesus. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And they mocked him. And they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him out to be crucified. It was nine in the morning when they crucified Jesus. From midday till three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. 